Good morning, everyone. I'd like to introduce our speaker we have here this morning, Cynthia O'Brien. I have a few notes here I want to quickly read to you. Has a BA from the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, along with a year that she spent at the University of Colorado. Cynthia lives and works in Ottawa and is an active member of the arts community there. She's helped organize the Blink Gallery, the Chinatown Remixed Arts Festival, and 260 Fingers, which is a yearly invitational exhibition. Cynthia believes there is a conversation between herself and Clay every time she touches it. This mutual respect of the material has resulted in the success of her sculptural work. She has been able to translate these, translate these interests of Clay into her job as an art instructor at the Pearly Rideau Veterans Health Centre for the past 13 years. Her work with people who live and die in long-term care have greatly influenced Cynthia. Along with her co-worker, Barbara Brown, they created the collaborative exhibition, Life Cycle Conversations, that was shown at the Carche Masson Gallery in Ottawa this past winter. Cynthia has been recognized by her peers through various grants and an award programs in Ontario, including the Explore and Create Program Grant from the Canada Council for the Arts and the Helen Copeland Memorial Award from Craft Ontario. She has participated in numerous artist residencies around the world, including Alberta, Canada, France, Australia, and here in the US. Cynthia's work has, can be found in various collections several that I think are quite impressive, is the Taipei County Yingi Ceramics Museum in Taiwan, the Canadian Arts Council the Art Bank, and along with our city of Ottawa. Now, I'd like to introduce to you my friend and an incredible ceramic artist, Cynthia O'Brien. I hope you enjoy her talk. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Um, I'd just like to thank Ensika for this really exciting adventure I've been on, and I hope you enjoy what I've come, ac um, come up with. Uh, just a warning, um, I get emotional, so I might have to uh, roll a little bit with the emotions. Okay, so I work at the Rideau Pearly Veterans Health Center, which is in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And just to give you a bit of a background to the facility itself, in 1941, the Rideau Veterans Home was created, and it was a temporary residence uh, for the rehabilitation of service personnel returning from the Second World War with 95 beds. In 1995, the Rideau Veterans Home um, combined with Hurley Hospital and the Veterans Wing of the National Defense Medical Center with 450 beds. We're called the Rideau Purley Veterans Health Center and we're funded by Veterans Canada, uh, which is an arm of reach of the Government of Canada. And that's where I get my money for my job. This is the view I see every time I get off the bus to go to work. And uh, the memorial in front is for the Second World War. And when a veteran dies, we bring the flags down. So you can already know that something's happened when you walk into work. So my main question is, do you know what your lasting influence on, in life is going to be? In the beginning. I, this is my studio at home. I, um, my studio is in the basement, so it's very dark. <laughs> I think of myself as an ordinary sort of person who was lucky to find at a young age that I was good at squishing clay. So I've been squishing clay ever since. This is how I think, I talk, I get out any kind of emotions I may have. After my parents, clay is the longest relationship. Passing through my basement studio at night, I can touch one of my pieces that have been burnished leather surface, and I instantly receive the release of tension that helps ground me, leaving me happy and calm. Of course, I've ruined the work, so I have to go back and burnish it again before I go to bed. The job. So this is who I am at my core of my being. I'm working away in my home studio, happy being alone with the material. I teach to make ends meet, the children in adult classes, I apply for funding, and I create exhibitions of my work. In 2005, I'm told of a job opportunity at a long-term care facility, teaching elderly people about clay and other arty stuff, and I say, why not? So I throw my hat into the ring, and I go for the interview. 
I don't really remember the interview, but it must have been okay because I've been, I was asked for a practicum after that. This is the studio that uh, the practicum happened and the studio that I work in. It's empty. It's just before lunchtime. And the last person standing is Jean. <laughs> you can see her. For the practicum, I find myself in a clay studio with several tables at different heights, with tools spread over the center line of the tables. My soon-to-be peers are hanging around and watching my every move. And as 9 o'clock comes along, so a couple of old guys roll into the room. I think I'm prepared. I think I've got this down, and I've been teaching and working with people for years. And I know the material, I know how to talk, and I, know I, and I have my plan. Within 10 minutes, the plan is scrapped. <laughs> the only thing I know at this point is that I have a room full of 80 to 90-year-old men and women who've made their way to class in wheelchairs and walkers. They have an assortment of con conditions from loss of limb, chronic arthritis, hearing loss, blindness, and some really have short memories. All of a sudden, I have no idea what I'm doing, and I don't know what to start, how to start. So I focus on one person. I focus on Rusty. Rusty is sitting across the table in the far corner with his tools at arm's reach, with a huge moving light that is positioned inches above his clay so he can see what he's doing. This is my guy. He's really grumpy, opinionated, and blind. So if I make Rusty happy, I've got a chance at the job. So I've been focusing on grumpy old men for about 13 years now. <laughs> Here are some of my grumpy men. <laughs> this is Norman. Um, Norman was my first love. <laughs> and um, when we met, uh, he could actually run uh, still. He would have a walker, and he would run down the corridor, leaving me behind, having a heart attack. And if he saw something on the floor, he would pick it up. He'd get down on his hands and knees and pick it up. And this is a 90-year-old man, and I'm like, oh, freaking right out. But he would come to the studio, and he would be very open and friendly and able to use um, his hands and uh, with a great sense of humor, he could create work with me. And this is the first monster I made um, at the Pearly and it ended up like this. So with this monster, I would start the process. I would say, you know, what kind of um, shape you, do you want to start with? And you can see that my ears are still attached to it. But then he would just morph it into whatever was happening in his head. And then we'd go back and we would paint it afterwards. I still have this. It's hanging in my bedroom. This is Howard. Um, Howard is a, is a studio junkie. Uh, he's been... Um, coming for years. Actually, I think he started when I started, and he'll come to the studio day and night if he could. And he has his own language, so it's all about yabba gabba doos and stuff like that, so you have to translate it in your head. Um, and he and I share our birthday, so every year I get to have a really good birthday with him. This is Colbert. Uh, when I first met Colbert, he was depressed, and so I went into his room, and everything I said to him, he shot down. And I left his room crying. <laughs> and, but I kept on going back. And I would meet him every week, uh, twice a week. And sooner or later, he and I became very good friends. And he became my guy in the studio. And he would come to the studio. And we would work together. And we decided to have a show. And so he wanted to call the show Le Grand Cobert Show. So it happened to be in the boardroom where all um, the managers do their meetings and everything like that, so it's a good venue to show off the work that we do. And one side of the boardroom, we had um, these shelves made by a colleague, and we put up all his mugs. We call it the mug mania. So with making the mugs and the platters, Colbert would roll out a slab, and if you've ever rolled out a slab while sitting down, it's a lot of hard work. And he would choose two colors, and I'd give him a third, and I would, we would put the colors at 9, 12, and 3 o'clock, and he would just go at it with his giant paintbrushes. And he would create these beautiful abstract uh, color renditions of whatever was happening. And then I'd go back to him, and we would discuss what to do, how to make the project, or, or where to go with it. And so he was very much interested in mugs, so we made a lot of mugs. 
and on the other side of the boardroom was this work, and I thought, silly, uh, that Colbert was going to be another Norman, so I made him a little cat one day, just squished it out of clay, and then I walked away thinking, oh, he's going to imbue it with something beautiful, and uh, he took a mallet and squashed it. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we looked at it and we kind of went, okay, what are we going to do now? And he so much enjoyed the whole process of squishing a cat that we decided to squish other animals. So we have um, a turtle, a skunk, even a, a, an elephant there. And in the end, we called it roadkill. <laughs> and we enjoyed that, but a lot of the people who work at the uh, Pearly Rito uh, got back to us that it was just not very good. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, John. He's now my true love. Uh, John is on the locked unit of the Alzheimer's uh, ward, and I have to go to see him. He won't come out very often. Uh, but, and John has difficulty. He has Alzheimer's, and he has um, problems with change, and that makes him aggressive. So he doesn't really understand why he's aggressive. He's very unhappy, and so he lashes out at the people who give him care. And so when I come along, and I'm not giving him care, and we're talking about, you know, weather or the ducks or um, even squishing a piece of clay, John actually starts to relax and says, oh, I can hang out with this person. And um, John has been a great influence on me because I can take him things and he can give me a critique on the work that is just brilliant. So I keep going back to him. He and I did the, the design on this little plate. I did a series of these plates. And so uh, we'll create a plate with the residents, uh, I, we, resident in an eye, and then I'll go back and we will design the plate. So this is painted by me, but it's designed by John, and he placed all the squares and the rectangles exactly where he wanted them. I put in the words because when we were doing this, I didn't really understand what was going on, and when we finished and I took it back to him, he, all he had to say was, the trigger's in the wrong place. So I guess he liked it. This is Gib. Uh, Gib actually grew up uh, two blocks away from where I live right now. And Gib and his friend Kelly were part of the march that happened in 1945. It's where 80,000 allied POWs ma were marched through uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Germany during the months of January to April. So that's a really, it was a really hard march. And um, because of that, uh, Kelly and Gib after dealing with the war and the march, uh, they became very close, but they lost touch with each other. And when um, Gib came to the Pearly Rito, he uh, befriended Kelly again. So that was a really nice thing to see after six years of being apart. Uh, Gib is also a really big political junkie. So he's the spokespeople, spokesperson for veterans if they ever come to the Pearly. And this is William. William and Gib are holding portraits of themselves. William is a giant flirt. <laughs> um, he'll he'll um, chat you up and make you feel like you're the center of everything. And then the next day you'll see him doing it to another woman. So it's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how many people can say that they get paid to do what they love in the world uh, with a little bit of a twist? So we ha do have 450 people living with us. So there's a lot of central events. And so this is where the fun comes out. Um, so on the left is Halloween. I'm the tooth fairy <laughs> with uh, my coworker Wyatt as the mummy. And on the, le on the right, or whatever, um, the green people. <laughs> it's a spring uh, festival for the green man uh, to bring out spring and fertility. So Ross, my coworker, is the green man, and I'm the green fairy. And I went around bonking people on the head with my giant flower, giving them good wishes. <laughs> OK. So I get to squish clay, and my enjoyment draws the resident in and gives them the room and opportunity to relax and be themselves. They watch, make comments, and th maybe physically participate. It also helps that I have really big blue eyes that smile when I work. They really get into that. It is important to what we do is fun but not childish. The residents pick up on the nuances, and they have their dignity. We are creating a story through the squishing, rolling, stamping, and shaping of the clay. 
There is an intimacy in this story. It is a story about that moment between myself, the clay, and Glenn. This story comes out in many ways through, through touch, talk, smiles, and a general easiness in both of us and our interactions with each other. This easiness carries from week to week, and I call it friendship. Glenn sometimes forgets the project, but I remember. I walk through the process with him, and he becomes engaged all over again and looks forward to the final piece. Residents often forget about their work that they make with me but are, and are always surprised and delighted when I show them the final piece. For both of us, us, this is a good day's work. So some of the projects we've done. So one of my co-workers had to cut down their uh, oak tree in the backyard, so we decided to recreate that oak tree. And so this is a three-part clay piece with um, fabric painted leaves on top. And you can see Norman sitting in front of it. It's just outside the dining room where Norman used to eat. These are our anchors. So um, as you know, a lot of uh, the residents, the ones that I hang out with, uh, fought during the Second World War, Army, Air Force, and Navy. And um, for five years, I was in the Naval Reserve while I was going through university. So I have an affiliation with the Navy guys. So every time if we meet a Navy guy, it's kind of like, oh, let's talk about ships. <laughs> and they like to re hash ship things and all the time. So we did this anchor project and this was mainly done on the Alzheimer's unit. So I'm dealing with a lot of people who don't want to touch clay, who don't want to communicate and are slightly, uh, you know, they're angry, they're frustrated, they're confused. So um, making something uh, simple for them to do, but then effective that they can see their final process and coming through. So the anchors were really good. It's a simple coil or a squish, but then you can see the hand in the final piece. So it's, it was very important to be able to see the hand and to create an anchor that was also uh, recognizable as an anchor because they're Navy guys. They understand what anchor, anchors look like and what they do. So each one is designed specifically for an anchor that that I researched. Um, every so often I will do something other than clay. So we do have a wood shop, a painting studio, we do silk scarves and mosaic. So every so often I'll bring a giant canvas and we'll do a 2D. So the background is paint, acrylic, and the anchor itself is um, shreds of newsprint. So this is uh, the small plate design pieces again. So in this case, you can see where my hand is more prevalent, while other pieces, is, there's more of a, the resident's hand. So it's important to be able to um, kind of facilitate what's going to happen. If the resident is not interested, but is, wants the conversation, enjoys choosing colors, wants to do the design, but doesn't want to touch anything, then I'm more involved. Uh, if the resident is more interested in doing everything themselves, like the top middle piece, that's Victor's piece, I will go, yeah, go to town. Um, in other cases, they'll, they'll take the piece away and obviously scratch off all the glaze. <laughs> and so, you know, it's a give and take, but it's also a really interesting and wonderful way to see what can come out of, of um, their imaginations. These are our monsters. So with the monsters, it's creating the piece with the resident and then coming back and glazing it and then placing it within the room. Um, so in this case, this, this piece is in, in uh, Victor's room and it's very sparse, so it actually added a little bit of character to it. This is Hyman. Hyman's not a clay person, he's a singer, and um, he's been banned from the chorus. <laughs> and so we sing in his room quite a lot, and we're both tone deaf, so it's quite good. Um, but his little monster went onto his wall. So a lot of residents have very um, ample, you know, like their family brings everything to their room. These are Howard's plates. They're based on Charlie Harper's work. And so I have a giant book of Charlie Harper and I'll give the book to Howard and he'll go through and find the image that he wants to do. And then we'll choose colors, we'll slip the slab and then he'll scraffito through and create his own version of Char Charlie Harper's work. 
And these are the portraits that we did. So this is mainly me doing, making a portrait of the resident that, who's in front of me. But they have um, input as well. The, they can dislike it or like it. <laughs> they can change it. For this one here, this is Doug. And when I made this, I, I love Doug. <laughs> um, he has the best face. It's all wrinkly. And I, when I showed it to him, he went, oh, hmm, it looks like Donald. And I was like, oh, great. I messed it up. And just as he was saying that, the nurse walked by and said, do you know who Donald is? And I said, no. And he goes, oh, Donald is his twin brother. <laughs> And this is Ralph. Um, I don't have a picture of Ralph, um, but he comes up later on in my talk, so I thought you'd like to see my rendition of his face. In the moment. Much of the work that goes on at long-term care facility is the assessment of residents, documentation, updating information, and reading daily reports. But I have found what works best for me is to take people as they are in that moment. Not to think of their families, history, medication, physical or mental impairments, but to think of Ted, who sits across from me in that moment. It is a simple friendship with the added benefit of building my confidence as well as his. The majority of the residents that I meet who live through the, have lived through the Second World War, and many have some form of dementia and Alzheimer's diseases. They have lost cognitive thought, the use of language, control of their body. Sometimes they don't understand why or how they do certain things. When this happens, there's frustration, confusion, and anger is very close. When I come across a particular resident in the hallway, I knock on their door, or, or I knock on their door, and I always ask them if I can bug them. If they agree, I talk and I ask, ask questions. Move from the doorway into the room on my trusted little stool. The stool goes anywhere at any speed across the room to the resident's side. I make a table with the cafeteria tray between our knees, and I start to squish clay into something that we both understand, fish, trees, cars. I talk, I squish clay, they watch. If I start in the hallway with one person, a small group grows. People will slowly make their way closer, just to have a better sight line, just to be part of the group. Yeah. Sorry. Mm. There we go. In the case of making the tiger mask, my friend Ralph, who you saw earlier, was crucial to the process. We would work on the tiger and place it on the floor, and Ralph would tell me the nose needed to work on or the ears were wrong. During this time, our talk would imbue the tiger with a personality. It turned out that he was pretty friendly, but he ate children. When the, when the tiger was finished, I asked if we should, call, what we should call him, and Ralph firmly stated he should be called Ralph. <laughs> So when it came to putting Ralph somewhere in the, in, in the facility, we talked about putting him in his room or in the hallway, and we ended up putting Ralph in the dining room where Ralph sits. So this picture is taken from where Ralph actually sits, and he can see his, himself as a tiger every time he has a meal. This is Colbert and I. This is during... Um, uh, uh, a festival called uh, Populous 150. Canada just had its 150th anniversary in 2017, and the Guild of Potters decided to do a project involving anyone in the community, and we were part of this. We made roses. So we had roses recognizing the English, fleur-de-lis recognizing the French, and feathers recognizing the First Nations people. And there were 9,000 pieces made, and they did an installation outside the National Museum of Nature. And so uh, the day they had their opening, we filled the, a bus full of people, and we went down to see it. And Colbert and I spent a lovely day looking at his work. <laughs> These relationships are magical and wonderful, but short-lived. I go through the whole process of making a friend very fast. The shyness at the beginning, the gained confidence within the relationship, teasing, knowing their small quirks and mood swings. Then they start to come out of themselves. They see me as a friend they want to hang out with, and then they will start to participate in something I love, squishing clay. I start to visit them every week, and at times I earn a nickname, Pixie the Duck Girl Tutu. In the summer, John and I can visit the duck pond, and in the winter we sit in the warm sunshine. Jack and I visit artwork that hangs throughout the facility, 
and we start to discuss which work is best, and every week we start again, and that choice changes. This repetition helps Jack's mind hold onto ideas, actions, and even me. The ongoing conversation helps both Jack and I figure out our next project. These relationships have changed me and touched my heart. Colbert and I have had arguments, and I make mistakes, and Colbert can get very angry, but I try to see his anger through. He slowly comes back around and sees me and says, we must not fight, we must be friends. Then there is the one day I walk into the room and my friend is sick or palliative. I visit and sit with them and tell them how I feel and how much they mean to me. I share stories with, with their families and tell them how wonderful their father or grandfather is, and then they die. The next week, I go, go down the same corridor and start the process all over again with Alf. This is a flower I made for Colbert. It is difficult, so I go back to the clay in my own time in my own studio. The clay work gives me the time to move through my thoughts and feelings, my sadness. I try to create in something in remembrance of those I have lost. I squish, roll, refine the clay, and with every mo movement, I imbue the clay with the spirit of my friend. That is mine, and every time I see that piece, I see those who have died. I see Norman, Colbert, and Ralph, and sometimes it is public, but most of the time it is a private matter. The beauty of working with the people of Long in Rideau Purley is that they enrich my life with friendship, confidence, and purpose. What we forget is the daily, is sometimes we forget is the daily feeding, cleaning, and recreational needs. The paperwork documenting how many units of liquid has been consumed and that discrete question about bowel movements. These are all things that must be done to sustain life for funding, for family meetings, for medical interventions, for each and every resident living in long-term care. My work is as much a basic need to these residents. For these people living in a facility at the end of their lives, my work gives them a new way to express themselves and a feeling of purpose, hope, dignity, and pride. I know that what I do helps the resident and it makes it easier for nurses, doctors, and managers to do their job. What started as just throwing my hat into the ring has been the largest influence in my life and in my personal work. I hope that every day I give back as much as I get and that the love I feel for my friends comes out in everything I do. Thank you. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can come down and use the mic or yell really loudly. <laughs> They will make the plates. Um, everything we do, I get them to try to do most of the work. As you can see, my hand is in a lot of the work, but um, I'm there to facilitate. So if they can roll out a slab or roll out a coil, they will be doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So every time um, I have a shift, I have to do attendance, but I also have to give information of what happened. So if something happens in the class that I think is, should be discussed, I will discuss it, um, even if nothing happens. So when it came to John, um, they changed the dining rooms around, and that was a big change for him, and he locked himself in his room. So when you lock yourself in your room and you're not taking, um, you're, you're being physically aggressive with the caregiver, things don't happen for you and so I would go into his room and it would um, stink quite literally and so um, after a couple of weeks of me going in every day every time I was working and sitting with him he slowly st started feeling a bit better and I would I, finally I asked him if he wanted his hair cut so I took him to get his hair cut and so with my interaction with him it gave um, it, get, it broke down that barrier, um, and so he came out of the room, they got to clean it, and then he started to kind of like go, oh, there's something more, and, and he could start dealing with the change of the dining room, and now he goes to his new dining room, and he's okay now, and the room is fine. <laughs> so every time we have something like that, you have to, to, to um, talk, to, uh, write it out, but it's also the nurses, 
don't see everything I see, and I see different things. I, I see mood swings too, so it's always, we work as a team. I don't combat with anyone. <laughs> and that's why I use the word bug. I'm going to bug you. Can I bug you? They know that bug is a negative term, but they also know it's a playful term. Um, I know I'm walking into their space, and uh, so I have to be respectful of that. And I think it helps. Um, I mainly work with men, so um, it helps that I'm a cute little blue-eyed girl. And, and they're very receptive to me, personally. But I'm also, I have this strange, quirky sense of humor. I don't mind dirtiness. We talk about squished animals a lot and stuff, so. Um, but if, they're, if they say no to me, I go. But I will return, right? So they say no to you, you leave, you give them 10 minutes, you come back. They could be in a totally different uh, mindset in 10 minutes time. So you kind of have to play along with it. And sometimes you instigate the anger. <laughs> so you have to kind of like back out. Uh, last week I did do that. A uh, gentleman was very um, confused, so I walked down the hall with him. And because I wasn't being, you know, really kind of like, okay, we're doing A, B, and C, I was like, what do you want to do? Um, he got very aggressive and shook his walker and yelled at me. Um, so I stood back and I lowered my voice and I said, we're going to your room. <laughs> and that kind of helped him. He was like, oh, okay. And then 10 minutes later, he apologized. So, you know, he could, he had enough cognizance to kind of see it through himself as well. Yeah. No. No, it's all the same tools. Yes, pin tools and, and fettling knives could be dangerous. Um, I just keep them in close to me. Um, sometimes people do eat the clay, but I don't think that's too bad. You know, it's just a little bit of clay. <laughs> oh, no, I don't, I'm, they're pretty good with their grit, well, so far. There are some times, you know, when you learn to, to write, you get that rubbery thing. They're making those rubbery things for certain things now, too, so it depends. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so what happens when I do something with one person in the hallway? I'm very much a one-on-one, -on -one and I do it on the fly. So I'll sit in the hallway, and people will hear me. I have a very loud voice, and they'll slowly make their way closer. And you can see it out of the corner of your eye. You can see them inching closer and closer, and there's another one coming. And by the end, I have four people around me, and they're like glued to what's happening. Yes, and then it's kind of like, well, what are we doing now? You know, I'm making a little house. Oh, we're going to put a windmill on it. Okay, and you know, and so the conversation gets people going, and then it gets their imaginations going as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's a government building, so it's eight-hour shifts. Um, I do an evening shift, a day shift, and a Saturday shift. And my shifts go between um, studio work, so people coming to the studio, interacting socially, mixing everybody from the three different wings that makes up the pearly, to going out on the unit doing one-to-one. -one. Um, if it's on the unit, um, I have an idea, and I take it to them, and if they shoot me down, then we make a new one. Um, if it's in the studio, most people in the studio like functional, <laughs> so it's a lot of rolling, stamping, making plates and bowls, but then every so often you've got, you know, a really keener, and so we can actually start to discuss. The problem is, is when you're discussing, you're taking yourself away from the larger group, so it's a kind of a give and take. When you've got 12 people in the room and you're spending 15 minutes with one individual, it's very difficult. So you got to play. Oh, um, uh, orange T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, the way it's set up at the Pearly is we've got a calendar and we have set classes. So if they don't want to do a clay, they can go to woodworking. There's also painting, there's silk. So they can look at the schedule and find something that they do like. If you start to mix your medium, uh, you get contamination. And also, they will work you. You will be their servant for the rest of your life. So be very careful, you know. <laughs> you have to be very strict. You need an advocator. Um, my job is only there because uh, my previous, my first boss, Danny Horn, created the um, 
creative arts uh, services that I work for. Um, since then, the Pearly Radio has become very much more a giant corporation. And so, so health and safety have come in, we're not special has come in, all these things. Um, it's a difficult road to go down. Um, Danny was extremely loud and, and she would just get in there and rumble. Uh, so you need to know, um, I would look to your uh, representatives of, of your municipality, your pr province, as well as um, your federal government too. Go to Veterans Affairs. Um, I don't know how you guys are dealing with your vets. Uh, we're moving from central locations to um, their home areas. That might actually help you because then um, you can find them in their own environments. Uh, any large or organization, and then you can cross-pollinate. You could even actually cross-pollinate with uh, the Pearly Rito because uh, they're such a large organization. There's only two in Canada, us and one in Toronto. So it's, you're dealing with a very um, hard thing to move forward with. We, we don't really um, like our elderly people. <laughs> and so um, it's, a, it's a good thing to go into and to um, prove, see, uh, prove that um, we are all going to get old and um, we all need the support and the care that, our, um, that we're, we're going to need and we need to give it, give it, to, give it to them right now too. Family are always welcome. Um, the problem with family is they get really, en they enjoy the process so much they take over. So you have to be very strict with the family member saying that you're working with your resident. Your, res your father, your mother are dealing, are working, and you're helping them to work. Yeah. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, <laughs> We don't have, like, um, the way that we uh, were brought into the facility is that we're professional artists working, and um, there's an opening, and we apply, and we get the job. Um, we're weird. We don't quite fit anywhere. We're not recreation, and we're not therapy. Um, so, really, we kind of have to make our own thing as we go. Like, yes, we work within a facility that has rules and regulations, and we have to go with that. And, of course, the nursing staff are uh, paramount to us. Um, but other than that, there's not a lot out there. But for your personal support? Yeah. No, they're looking... Um, they're starting to realize that uh, that uh, we're, we, um, the supporters, are uh, are being harmed by our job. Like I'm very emotional. If if I start talking, I I start crying really fast. I'm surprised I didn't cry here. Um, so uh, we have a spiritual care worker who's looking out for us and starting to create moments within the week to, to go and process some of the issues that we're dealing with. Uh, nursing care also has this problem too. I'm lucky I'm only part-time, but if you were full-time, you know, it'd be a very difficult job. <laughs> um, it's a marvel. I think now I would have to know more uh, when I walked in, I didn't even know what Alzheimer's was, you know. I didn't know the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's. And even now, it's intuitive. I think that's what, why they hired me, was that I'm intuitive to the person's need. I have empathy, and that's what they're looking for. Uh, they also want to see someone who um, can work on their own and, and get the resources out of themselves because there's not a lot of resources. So um, I know that my job's never going to change. It's just I meet a new person, I engage with them, and I meet a new person, I engage with them. Um, so if I have to change something, I have to change something within myself and, and, and move it forward. So um, other people in the facility can change. They can move from unit to unit. They can change their job. They can do all kinds of stuff. But we're pretty, you know, this is what we're doing. I've been doing Thursday, Tuesday night clay classes for 13 years. So it, it, it's just always there. Great. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>